Good evening, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to the Amicus Curiae Lecture Series. I'm delighted to see you all here. I'm Patricia Proctor, the director of the Simon Perry Center for Constitutional Democracy, which sponsors this series with help from the West Virginia Humanities Council, for which, of course, we're very grateful. Our spring lectures this year are going to relate to history, both history as we usually understand it, the past, and history in the making in about 10 days. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Cliff Sloan as our lecturer. Mr. Sloan is the co-author of a wonderful book called The Great Decision, Jefferson, Adams, Marshall, and the Battle for the Supreme Court. This book tells the fascinating story of the politics surrounding Chief Justice Marshall's most famous decision, Marbury versus Madison. Of course, here at Marshall, we're all very interested in all things Marshall, which was probably John Laidley's plan when he asked to have the school named after his late friend, the Chief Justice, John Marshall. But Mr. Sloan's background is also very interesting. And I'm not going to attempt to relate a full resume here, but I'd like to tell you a little bit. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. He's a former Supreme Court law clerk to Justice John Paul Stevens. He's former associate White House counsel in the Clinton administration and a former assistant attorney or solicitor general. For eight years, he worked for Washington Post Newsweek Interactive, which is the online subsidiary of the Washington Post. And he's a former publisher of Slate, as in Slate.com for those of you who follow it on the internet. Although he obviously has a love of history, hence the book, he also has a very cutting edge legal practice. He's now a partner with the law firm of Skadden Arps in Washington, DC. And he's a leading lawyer in a variety of areas, but in particular, First Amendment and intellectual property law. Um, he's considered one of the nation's leading lawyers in internet law. And just two weeks ago, he was arguing in the Supreme Court in a patent case. He has represented clients and does represent them at all levels of the state and federal courts, has argued many times in the U.S. Courts of Appeals and several times in the United States Supreme Court. Now, for those of us who like a little pop culture with our serious history and law, he represents what we in the business call sexy clients from time to time. He's represented Bon Jovi. He has represented the Rosetta Stone. He's represented the Principality of Monaco. Pretty cool stuff. He's also been on the Colbert Report, which is one of my favorite facts about him. <laughs> We're very fortunate to have him here tonight to educate and entertain us. Please join me in welcoming Cliff Sloan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being here. And I am very pleased to be here tonight. I get to talk about my favorite subject. Uh, I, it is also a special privilege to speak at Marshall University. You know, I have to tell you, and this probably won't surprise anybody in this room, but one of the great joys of working on the book was that for the, for the four years that uh, I was working on the book with my co-author and good friend David McCain, uh, what, one of the, my favorite parts about it was being able to live with John Marshall every day. He's such a fascinating personality. And in addition to his brilliance and his insights and his strategy and his vision, uh, he seems like an extraordinarily fun guy. And let me just tell you my favorite story, which you may have heard, but my favorite story about Marshall, which is that, you know, one of the many things that Marshall did to forge the Supreme Court into an effective institution and, and raise its prestige was that he had the justices stay in the same rooming house, in the same boarding house when they were in Washington for the few uh, times a year when they would have sittings of the Supreme Court and they would have their meals together. 
And they, he had a rule, which was that uh, you, they could only have their nightly drinks, their Madeira, if it was raining out. And so every night there'd be this little ritual. He would have a justice go to the window and look out and report on the weather. And of course, many days, the justice who was reporting on the weather would say, well, you know, it looks pretty clear today. And Marshall would say, our jurisdiction is so vast, it must be raining somewhere. <laughs> Break out the Madeira. <laughs> so, but it, it's also um, a special pleasure to be here today, because uh, tonight, because I have to uh, say, I understand that Professor Jean Edward Smith is here, and of course is the author of the most marvelous biography of uh, Marshall, which I'm sure you all know well, which um, I relied on, we relied on very extensively in the book, and it's without a doubt the finest judicial biography I've ever read and one of the finest biographies of any kind uh, that I've ever read and that I think has ever been written. So it's a real special privilege uh, to be here with Professor Smith here. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the background of our writing the book. And uh, David and I were getting very interested in the story of Marbury versus Madison, which is a political story. It is a story of DC. And we were realizing that very few people know the story of Marbury versus Madison. And one of the things that really symbolized that to us is that if you go to the National Archives in Washington, on the second floor, there's this massive Charters of Freedom Hall. And on any given day, there's a long line of visitors waiting to get in. And when you go in the hallway, the first thing you see is an original of the Declaration of Independence. And you can see people sort of awestruck by the Declaration of Independence. And they move on, and there's an original of the Constitution. And they move on, and the next uh, case, and it's climate control, is an original of the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. And then, the very next case, there are original documents from Marbury versus Madison. And you see these people with these looks of growing excitement, and then they get to the kind of Marbury versus Madison case, and they look sort of puzzled and maybe vaguely recall it from a, from a long ago uh, classroom. And of course, the card on the case says that Marbury versus Madison is a cornerstone of the rule of law because it's the first case in which the Supreme Court struck down an act of Congress as unconstitutional. But particularly because it was a time uh, when there was a lot of discussion about the American rule of law and what it meant, we thought that it would be a good idea to try to tell the story of Marbury versus Madison. And it actually turns out to be quite a story. Now, in, in understanding the story of Marbury versus Madison and the, the events of Marbury versus Madison, which really start in February 1801, there are three background themes that are very, very important in uh, sort of setting the stage for what happens in, in Marbury. And the first is realizing that in 1801, the institutions of the country, the political institutions of the country, were very young and unformed and fragile and raw and untested. Now, 1801, this is only 12 years after the government was first set up uh, under the Constitution, after the ratification of the Constitution, 1789, when George Washington becomes president. It's only 12 years after that. And there are two events right, that, that factor heavily as part of the background of Marbury, Marbury versus Madison that illustrates this fragility of the national political institutions. And the first is the election of 1800 because that was really the first uh, presidential election that we had that was contested by parties and really the first congressional elections. Now, in 1796, after Washington's two terms, when you had Adams and Jefferson running against each other, there was some sort of faint signs of party activity. Um, and, but by 1800, the parties had really emerged and crystallized. The Federalists under Adams and the Democratic Republicans under, Jeff uh, under Jefferson. And the election of 1800 was a very vicious partisan affair. I mean, people talk about the negative politics now. It had nothing on the election of 1800. Very fierce personal attacks, bitter, bitter partisan warfare. 
And what happens, you have the incumbent president, Adams, defeated. Now remember, Jefferson was the vice president because at the time, uh, it, the, the president was simply the person who got the most votes and the vice president got the second most votes. And so Jeff Jefferson was actually the incumbent vice president. But you have the incumbent president being defeated for the very first time. And this was like a, a political earthquake. And in fact, there was nothing quite like it in the history of the world that really compared to an incumbent president being defeated for re-election. And so this is all being played out for the first time in the election of 1800. And it's a sort of stunning event. Even more stunning is what happens after the election of 1800. Because you'll remember there was a very chaotic situation. Again, at the time, the president was uh, the person who got the most votes, the vice president the second most in the Electoral College. There was no way of designating when, uh, when the electors voted in the Electoral College who was president and who was vice president. So uh, uh, Jefferson and Aaron Burr had been running as a ticket. It was the first time there was a ticket. And so, of course, they got the same number of votes, the Jefferson-Burr ticket. So there, there was a tie in the Electoral College. So what happens when there's a tie in the Electoral College? Well, it goes to the House of Representatives to decide. And each state has one vote. And the House of Representatives, the Congress, was still controlled by the Federalists. It was the old Congress. The Republicans, as they were called, Jefferson's Democratic Republicans, had swept the congressional elections as well as the presidential election. But it was the old Congress that was going to decide uh, who was the president. And Aaron Burr, much to everybody's surprise, let it be known that actually it'd be fine with him if they voted for him for president. And the Federalists were determined, some of them, not to let Jefferson be president. And so they started voting for Burr for president, and the House was deadlocked. And nobody knew who the next president was going to be. Adams was defeated, but nobody knew who won. And there were all kinds of rumors. They actually, the Federalists were going to try to put in their own candidate, maybe John Jay, who had been the first Chief Justice, and now was governor of New York, maybe John Marshall, who had, uh, was Secretary of State, had just been named Chief Justice, a, con a former congressman from Virginia. Governor Thomas McCain, the governor of Pennsylvania, said that if anybody besides Jefferson was elected president, he was going to have the Pennsylvania militia march on Washington and prevent anybody else from becoming president by force because it would be an illegitimate election. That tells you something about where the institutions of the country were. And it, it remained deadlock un until two weeks before the new president was scheduled to take office on March 4th. And finally, on the 35th ballot, they broke the deadlock, some of the Federalists abstained, and Jefferson was elected president. But until that time, just shortly before March 4th, it was completely up for grabs who was going to be the president. So again, an illustration of how unformed and untested the country's political institutions were. Second important background theme is that the city of Washington, D.C. itself was raw, unformed, primitive, untested. Now, Washington had just become the national capital in June of 1800, and it was a mess. I mean, people had known from the early 1790s that it was going to be the national capital. And so what you, you had all kinds of aborted building plans with developers. There were half-built buildings, and then the developers had gone broke. Some of them had gone to jail. So there was this sort of ghostly specter of half-built buildings. Um, the, the, the city was sort of overwhelmed with mud. Pennsylvania Avenue, which ran and runs from the president's house, as it was known, to the capital, the most prominent street. It was described as a sea of mud. And by the way, you know it was named Pennsylvania Avenue as a sop to Pennsylvania for losing the capital, because Philadelphia was no longer going to be the capital, so they gave the most prominent street. But it was a sea of mud. And visitors to Washington were advised that if they were walking on Pennsylvania Avenue, they should carry a big stick with them for two reasons. One, to get a foothold in the mud, and the second, to ward off the wild hogs and pigs who kept sort of interfering with everybody on Pennsylvania Avenue. Jefferson, as vice president, you know, looked around Washington, saw what a state of disarray it was in, and said that he, the congressmen and the senators were going to have to live like animals in the fields because there was no place for them to stay. So physically, Washington was, uh, was a complete mess at, at the time. 
Okay, so that's the second important background theme. And the third important background theme is that the Supreme Court at the time was a, very, was a very weak and insignificant branch, and in no way was it equal in stature to Congress or the presidency. And you can see this a lot of different ways. First, start with George Washington's original appointees to the Supreme Court. I mentioned Chief Justice John Jay. He hated the job. They had to ride circuit. Um, they, they, they didn't do very much of consequence. By 1793, he wanted to be governor of New York. He thought that was far preferable, preferable to being Chief Justice. He ran, he didn't get elected. He then accepted Washington's appointment while he was Chief Justice to spend a year in London negotiating the Jay Treaty, which, became, which was very controversial. And when he came back, he ran again for governor of New York and was elected governor of New York and resigned. Another of Washington's original appointees resigned for the far more attractive position of Chief Judge of the South Car Carolina Court of Common Pleas. Another of Washington's original appointees wound up in debtor's prison while he was a justice and died soon after getting out of debtor's prison. And still another of Washington's original appointees had to leave the Supreme Court because he had this constant mysterious ringing in his ears. I mean, the Supreme Court was not a place people thought was a great place to be at the time. Jay's successor is Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth, after a couple of years on the court, accepted Adams's appointment to, be, to, to go to Paris and negotiate a treaty. He was there for a year and then decided he didn't want to come back. He was going to go to England for health treatment, for the baths. And so he sends a letter to Adams that he's not coming back and he's resigning as Chief Justice. And this is in December of 1800. Adams knows he's been defeated. They don't know who the new president is going to be. And so Adams needs to get a new Chief Justice. And so he thinks of John Jay, bringing John Jay back as uh, Chief Justice. And, and so he writes Jay a letter telling him how important it is. He, he wants him back as Chief Justice. And Jay immediately writes back, declining, and saying that he's convinced that the Supreme Court will never have any energy, weight, or dignity in our system. And basically, he wants nothing to do with it, which tells you something about the uh, status and stature of the Supreme Court at the time. And in fact, Jay sends the letter to John Marshall, who's the Secretary of State at the time. Marshall gives it to Adams in January 1801. Adams reads it and then turns to Marshall and says, well, then I guess I'll appoint you, which is how Marshall got the nomination uh, in, in January 1801. And the last point that emphasizes or highlights the lowly stature of the Supreme Court is that in the planning in the District of Columbia for the Capitol, there was, of course, a place for the president, the president's house, which became the White House. There was a place for the Congress, the Capitol at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Nobody made any provision for the Supreme Court at all. It just didn't occur to them. And you know, all of a sudden, the new Capitol gets going, and somebody goes, you know, we need a place for the Supreme Court. And the, so they're writing to the uh, Secretary of State, John Marshall, about it. Well, Marshall's got a lot on his plate at the time. He actually wasn't that interested. He's not really responding. He gets named Chief Justice. He got much more interested in that question. And, uh, and so then finally, at the last minute, they work out that the Supreme Court can use um, a small committee room in the basement of the Capitol, committee room two. And so that's going to be the place of, where the Supreme Court can meet. Again, an example of the Supreme Court's status at the time. OK, so those are the, the, the background themes that set the stage for the events of Marbury versus Madison. And the events really happen in, or they begin in February 1801. So this is Adams' is last month as president. He's going to be president until March 4th. And again, it's during, in the middle of this month is when it's decided that Jefferson's going to be the president. And Adams, during this month, is consumed with one thing above all. And that is making as many appointments of Federalists as he can before he leaves the government. This is the famous midnight judges, the late appointments. And a Adams is up late at night making these appointments. He writes Abigail Adams, the burden is heavy upon me with the appointments. He's, he's consumed with it. And there are two pieces of legislation that are passed around this time 
that give Adams a lot of additional appointments. I mean, he's appointing the United States attorneys, other uh, federal officials, but there are two new pieces of legislation that give him additional appointments. One of them is the Judiciary Act of 1801 which creates a lot of new federal judgeships and a new tier of the federal judiciary. And this is really, this is the Midnight Judges Bill. And so that gives Adams a lot of appointments um, of judges on his way out. And, and he is, you know, feverishly making the nominations, getting the still Federalist Senate to confirm them, getting them in place. And the other piece of legislation is the District of Columbia Act, which is setting up the government for this new District of Columbia. And there are all kinds of offices in the District of Columbia that can now be filled by presidential appointment uh, and, and Senate confirmation, including the justices of the peace in the, in the District of Columbia. But as I say, this is a very sort of chaotic time in the President's House because there's, uh, you know, uh, it, it, these pieces of legislation, especially the, the District of Columbia one, passes very late. He's got to get the nominations up. The Senate has to act on it. Then they have to get the commissions out to the people. And Adams is literally up late on March 3rd, his last night in office, signing commissions, getting them ready, and they're trying to get them out to people. And the person who's supposed to deliver a batch of the commissions to the justices of the peace can't carry all of them. So he leaves some of them on a table in the State Department. And then he forgets about them, or they run out of time. Anyways, they never get delivered. They're sitting on the table in the, in the State Department. The next morning, four in the morning on March 4th, Adams leaves town. He doesn't want to be there when Jefferson is sworn in as president at noon. Jefferson walks to the inauguration. It's a great sort of democratic symbol that he's walking. He tries to give a, 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 a conciliatory speech, a speech of reconciliation after this bitter election and after this chaos of the post-election uh, contest with Aaron Burr. He says, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists, basically we are all Americans. And he's trying to strike this conciliatory note in his inauguration. And within a day or two after his inauguration, Jefferson goes over to the State Department. And he's looking around. And he sees this batch of commissions sitting on the table. And he looks at them. And one thing you have to know is that Jefferson was incensed by Adams's uh, flurry of last minute appointments by the midnight appointments throughout February. I mean, Jefferson uh, later wrote to Abigail Adams that there was one thing and one thing only that your husband did that I thought was personally unkind, and that was making all these appointments when he knew that it was his successor who was going to be in office with them. Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe at the time are writing these angry letters to each other that, you know, Ad, uh, Adams embarrasses us, it, it's his disgrace. Grace. Jefferson was incensed um, by this government packing that Adams was doing on the way out. So Jefferson sees these commissions and he says, stop, do not deliver these, we're not letting these go through. Okay, so that's in uh, February and March 1801. The next thing that happens is that in December 1801, the new Congress convenes for the first time, and this is the new Republican Congress, and there's this great air of anticipation in Washington. I mean, this is the first time a new Congress is coming in with Washington as the capital. It's also the first Republican Congress, and the Republicans are very eager and excited, and editors of Republican newspapers from outside Washington are there to witness the historic events. The Federalist newspapers are writing with great anxiety about what's in store. And in the middle of the month, uh, Charles Lee, who was the attorney general under Adams, so a very esteemed lawyer and a very well-known Federalist, files a suit in the Supreme Court. And it's on behalf of William Marbury and three others who had been appointed Justice of the Peace, but they had never gotten their commissions. And so they had never gotten their jobs. And actually, the other three besides Marbury were far more eminent citizens than Marbury. I mean, they were former mayors of Alexandria. One was a very, very close colleague of George Washington. And they, so they file in the Supreme Court, and they ask the Supreme Court to order 
James Madison, the Secretary of State, and the Jefferson administration to deliver the commissions and give them their jobs. And that the technical term for that is a mandamus order. They asked the Supreme Court for an order of mandamus saying deliver the commissions, give them their jobs. And so Charles Lee files this and the next day he gets a hearing in the Supreme Court and he fervently argues for it. And a couple days later, the Supreme Court issues an order to show cause why the mandamus should not be granted. And what that means is that the Supreme Court says, he's shown us enough that you, James Madison, and the Jefferson administration, and Thomas Jefferson, you have to justify yourself. You have to show why we shouldn't do what they're asking, in order that the commissions be delivered, in order that they get their, uh, their jobs. And Marshall says, we're going to set this as the first order of business when we reconvene in June of 1802. So the first thing we do when we come back is you're going to have to explain yourself, you're going to have to justify what you did. Now this causes an uproar. Jefferson and his allies in Congress, they can't believe it. I mean the Supreme Court, this puny institution, is issuing an order saying, uh, suggesting they did something wrong and that they have to justify themselves and it's on the most sensitive of political issues at the time, which are these last minute appointments that Adams made as he was leaving office. And they immediately react. Jefferson the next day writes a letter to a friend where he says it is clear that the judiciary is a place where the Federalists are retreating to undo all of our works. Uh, Jefferson's allies in Congress write letters very concerned about the, uh, the uh, very concerned about this order and what it shows in their view about the court. And when the Congress reconvenes in early January 1802, the first thing that happens is that Jefferson's allies in Congress, the Republicans in Congress, file a bill to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801, to eliminate the midnight judges, to eliminate all these new judges that Adams had appointed and that were in place. And it's sort of like they're now viewing this as a declaration of war, and so, okay, they're gonna, they're, they're, they're gonna get rid of the act that had bothered them tremendously. And this becomes the, do the dominant issue in Congress in early 1802. And it's, and it's a very, very very fierce political combat. Um, there are references in the debates to the order to show cause on the mandamus from the Marbury versus Madison. And the Federalist opponents say it would be unconstitutional to do that. These federal judges have life tenure. If you pass a law getting rid of their positions, the Supreme Court will strike it down as unconstitutional. And the Jeffersonians in Congress, at least some of them say, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court doesn't have power to declare an act of Congress unconstitutional. We, the Congress, are the ones who determine constitutionality. The Supreme Court doesn't have that power. And so they have this pitched battle over it with references to the Supreme Court's action uh, in Marbury. The Republicans pass the Repeal Act, and they do something else also because they are well aware that Marshall has set the Marbury case as the first order of business in June of 1802, and there also are a lot of predictions that the Supreme Court is going to quickly take up a challenge to the constitutionality of the Repeal Act. So what do they do? They shut down the Supreme Court for a year. They legislatively change the schedule of the Supreme Court so that it cannot meet again until February of 1803. Now, the justices are going to have to ride circuit again. They didn't have to with this new tier of federal court, so they'll have something to do during that year. They have to ride circuit. But the Supreme Court cannot meet as an institution again until February of 1803. So that's what happens. The Supreme Court does not meet throughout 1802, meets again in February 1803, and the first order of business is the request for a mandamus, and it's a trial. And because Charles Lee has to get in the record and establish that they 
uh, got their commissions that, that, uh, and, and that the commissions weren't delivered. So he calls clerks from the State Department who testify about what happened, and there's a, there's a trial in the Supreme Court. It's submitted, and a couple weeks later, on February 24th, John Marshall announces the unanimous opinion of the Supreme Court. Now, there are a couple of things that are notable about Marshall's announcement before we get to the opinion. And the first one is that the opinion was announced in the lobby of a hotel. And the reason for this is that one of the justices, Samuel Chase of Maryland, who was known as Old Bacon Face, um, had the gout. And the justices were staying in Stell's Hotel, which was a, right across from the Capitol, short walk to the Capitol, actually very near to where the Supreme Court building is right now. But um, Chase couldn't, couldn't get out of Stell's Hotel. It was too painful for him uh, to move. And another justice wasn't there, so they couldn't have a quorum. And there actually were a couple of days of the Supreme Court that were canceled for lack of a quorum. And then apparently Marshall had this bright idea, well, if he can't come to the Supreme Court, we'll have the Supreme Court come to him. And it says in the Supreme Court records, due to the disposition of one of the justices, court proceedings were held in Stell's Hotel. And, you know, and, and Stell's Hotel was a very nice hotel. I think the lobby was much better than the sort of small, dark committee room that they had in the basement of the Capitol. But anyway, so Marshall is presiding in the lobby of Stell's Hotel. And the other thing that is notable is that he was announcing the opinion of the court. And this was, again, an innovation that Marshall had brought to the Supreme Court. They had done it in some earlier cases. Before Marshall, all of the justices announced their opinions individually, seriatim, as they called it. And so you didn't have one single opinion for the court. You had a result from the court, but each justice explained it a little differently. And one of Marshall's great innovations was having this authoritative voice for the Supreme Court in opinions that he usually wrote. So Marshall starts reading the unanimous opinion of the Supreme Court. And he says there are three questions here. And the first one is, does Marbury, and for some reason, the other plaintiffs in the case are never mentioned again. They just sort of drop out. And he says, does Marbury have a right to the job. Did Madison, did the administration violate the law when they prevented him from getting his job when they didn't deliver the commission? And Marshall and the Supreme Court say, yes, that broke the law because once he was nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate and his commission was signed, Everything that needed to be done was done, and he was entitled to the job, even though uh, the commission wasn't delivered. So Marshall then moves on to the second question. And the second question is, well, is he entitled to a remedy? And Marshall and the court say, yes, he's entitled to a remedy. We're a government of laws, not of men. Where there's a wrong, there's a remedy. Of course, he's entitled to a remedy in our system of uh, in our system of the law and of legal redress. And so then Marshall and the Supreme Court go on to the third question. Well, is he entitled to the remedy that he seeks, which is an order of mandamus from this court? And here's where Marshall veers in a very unexpected direction. Because he says, well, they came here with an original request, and we had this trial here, for us to grant an order of mandamus. And the law that Congress passed in 1789, setting up the judiciary, the Judiciary Act of 1789, said that they could do that, said that they could come to this court as an original matter and ask for a writ of mandamus. But, Marshall says, that's not what the Constitution says. Article three of the Constitution says we are an appellate court, not a court of original jurisdiction. There's some very limited exceptions to that. Those exceptions don't apply here. So the law of Congress, allowing some of them to come to the court as an original matter, conflicts with the Constitution, and we're going to declare it unconstitutional. And there's a very explicit discussion there about whose role it is to determine constitutionality or unconstitutionality. And the Supreme Court says, 
It is emphatically the duty and province of the judicial department to say what the law is. In other words, the Supreme Court has the last word on the law and on Constitution, and we declare it unconstitutional. Therefore, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Marbury loses his case because he, had, it, uh, he didn't have a right to file an original action in the Supreme Court. Now, when you think about it, this was really kind of a triple bank shot for Marshall, this opinion, because first, in finding that Marbury was wrongly denied his commission, he blasted the Jefferson administration. He severely criticized them for violating the law. It's by far the most severe criticism of a president in a Supreme Court opinion up till that point. Second, he did it in a context when they could not defy his order. Now, a lot of people thought this was headed toward a confrontation between the Supreme Court and, and President Jefferson and the Jefferson administration. And if there had been that confrontation, I think undoubtedly the Supreme Court would have lost that. I mean, the Jefferson administration, Jefferson was surging in popularity. I think in the 1804 election, he lost only two states. And he, and he was at the, at the height of his popularity, and here was the Supreme Court, which, as we said, it had a very sort of lowly status. But the way that Marshall decided it, he did not allow for a, sort of a confrontation or defiance. And third, far more importantly for the long run, he established the principle that the Supreme Court has the power and authority to strike down a law as unconstitutional. And this was really a very momentous event. The Supreme Court had never done it. No court had ever done that. No national court had ever done that with a coordinate branch of government. They had done it with local governments, but no court had ever done that. And Marshall established that principle in Marbury versus Madison. And beyond that, there was something else that Marbury did, I'm sorry, that Marshall did that was very important in Marbury which is that the opinion lifted the court from the day-to-day -day politics. Because here you had all these justices appointed by the Federalists. And many people were expecting they were going to side with the Federalist office holder. And it was going to be this very predictable political dynamic. And the way that Marshall and the Supreme Court decided the case it broke that political pattern. It made clear that the Supreme Court was not just a predictable political player. Each side won something, each side lost something. In fact, there's a friend of mine who says, you know, imagine if you were Jefferson's White House counsel at the time, and, uh, which there was not that position, but imagine if you were his White House counsel, and he says to you, and, and you tell him, you know, the Supreme Court decided the Marbury case, and he says, well, did we win? What exactly do you say? Well, technically, but there's a lot in the opinion you're not going to like. And partly because of that, the reaction at the time, you can see it in both the Republican press and the Federalist press, they, in, in a way they didn't know what to make of it. They were generally praising of it mildly. They reprinted the opinion in full, and they basically seemed to react as that the court had acted as a court, that it had acted with fairness. Now, at the extremes, there was, uh, on both sides of the, the spectrum, there was criticism uh, or there was um, uh, focus on the parts of the opinion that they either really liked or really didn't like. Alexander Hamilton said, aha, the opinion shows that Jefferson has broken the law since his first day in office. That's what Marbury stands for. And at the other extreme, there were some Republican writers and some Republican office holders who said, where does the Supreme Court get the idea that it has the power to strike down acts of Congress as unconstitutional? That's outrageous. And there were other Republicans who said, well, if Marshall and the Supreme Court were going to find that they didn't have jurisdiction, then they shouldn't have included anything else about the merits of the dispute and about the fact that the Jefferson administration broke the law. But those were at the extremes, and in general, the press reacted to it as though um, something had happened that was different from the usual political dynamic. And something else that happened two weeks later reinforced that. Because two weeks later, in a little known opinion called Stewart versus Laird, the Supreme Court considered whether the repeal of the Judiciary Act was unconstitutional. And it rejected the challenge to it. It found that the repeal was constitutional. It was a brief opinion. 
But that was really a remarkable opinion at the time because here you had this legislation was detested by the Federalists. They predicted it would be struck down as unconstitutional. It had become the flashpoint. It was one of the Republicans' proudest achievements. And here the justices, all appointed by the Federalists, upheld it, which again showed the court wasn't going to be a predictable political player. But it also showed that the Supreme Court, having established that it had the power to strike down acts of Congress as unconstitutional. It was going to be very careful and sparing in its use of that power. And in fact, the Marshall Court never again struck down an act of Congress as unconstitutional, struck down state statutes, but it never again struck down an act of Congress as unconstitutional. And so Marbury then becomes this icon of the rule of law. And you can see that any number of ways. It continues to have very profound impact on the justices. Former Chief Justice William Rehnquist said that uh, Marbury versus Madison was the single greatest contribution that Americans made to the art of government. Former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said that because of Marbury, each of us has rights that no political branch can take away from us, that the President and Congress cannot take away from us because the Supreme Court is the ultimate arbiter of constitutionality. Justice John Paul Stevens, as you heard, for whom I had the privilege of clerking, we interviewed him for the book, and he went on at length about the impact of Marbury on him from his first days as a law student after World War II through his 35 years on the court, where, as he said, he invoked Marbury every chance he got. You can see it in moments of great challenge and crisis at the Supreme Court. In 1958, a few years after Brown versus Board of Education, when the state of Arkansas said it was not going to follow Brown versus Board of Education because it, the state, was going to interpret the Constitution and give effect to its interpretation of the Constitution, where in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court in Cooper versus Aaron, unanimously, with each of the justices signing separately, said, no, in our system of government, under Marbury versus Madison, it's the courts and it's the Supreme Court that has the last word on interpreting the Constitution. In 1974, at the height of the Nixon tapes controversy, Chief Justice Warren Burger, appointed by President Nixon, reacted to President Nixon's position. You'll recall President Nixon said, as the president, I'm the one who determines the scope of executive pr privilege and the constitutional contours on that. And Chief Justice Berger again said, no, under Marbury versus Madison in our system, it's the Supreme Court and the federal courts that have the final say on this, the interpretation of the Constitution. And it's not only in the United States that, it, that Marbury has had this kind of impact. It's been an inspiration and a beacon around the world. And I have to tell you, one of the most interesting things since uh, the book came out in 2009 is that when my co-author and I give talks about it, very frequently after the talk, people from other countries and other continents will come up to us and we'll talk about how important and meaningful Marbury was to them in their education, in their country, in, in places that, where the rule of law was a, a challenge, where there were a lot of principles that were still up in the air. We've had people say that to us from South America, from Africa, from India, from throughout Asia. They had this kind of profound impact on them. And in 2009, soon after the book came out, you may recall there was a crisis in Pakistan about their judiciary. And uh, a number of the judges there were objecting to limits on their independence. And it became a, a, a national controversy and crisis. And through the magic of the internet, I was able to see on the front page of the largest newspaper in Pakistan, there was this big article about Marbury versus Madison. And it said that, it talked about Marbury versus Madison. It said it was the first time in history that a court had struck down uh, an act of a coordinate branch, how important that was for the rule of law. It said because of that, Marbury versus Madison was the greatest decision ever issued and that it should be an inspiration to the people of Pakistan as they tried to find their way through that crisis. Now, that's Marbury on a pedestal. And I think it richly deserves that pedestal. But I also want to briefly note that there are also some complexities, some messy complexities about Marbury. And let me take a moment just to mention a few of the messy complexities uh, about Marbury. 
The first one is the role and involvement of John Marshall in the underlying facts and events of the case. Now, remember, Marshall had been Secretary of State, and then he was nominated and confirmed and sworn in in early February 1801. Adams asked Marshall if he would stay on as Secretary of State through the end of his administration, even though he was already Chief Justice, and Marshall agreed, a simultaneous wearing of hats that would be unthinkable today. And in the month of February 1801, there was nobody who worked more closely with Adams on his midnight appointments than John Marshall, his Secretary of State. Marshall was responsible for the paper flow. In fact, Marshall was responsible for making sure that people got their commissions. It was Marshall's bungle that the commissions didn't get to Marbury and the others. Even more starkly, the person, the messenger in the State Department who couldn't carry all of the commissions and left some on the table that Jefferson found was Marshall's brother, James Marshall, who Marshall had asked in the chaos of the moment, can you deliver these commissions? And in fact, in the Supreme Court proceedings, there was an affidavit from James Marshall explaining exactly what he had done and that, yes, he had left the commissions on the table because he couldn't carry them all. Now, if that were to happen today, there is no question that John Marshall uh, would have to recuse himself from the case because of his personal involvement and his brother's personal involvement at his request in the underlying facts or events. The recusal standards at the time were far less established. It applied to a personal financial interest and beyond that it was unclear and murky. But it certainly is a messy complexity. A second messy complexity is that the Chief Justice John Marshall and the President Thomas Jefferson you all may know this, hated each other. And they were cousins. I think Marshall's great-grandfather and Jefferson's grandfather were brothers. And they absolutely detested each other. You know, I was talking at the beginning about Marshall's wonderful personality. And uh, he loved everybody. Everybody loved him. Henry Adams said, with one exception, he could not stand Thomas Jefferson. And the feeling was mutual. And there were many reasons for this. Some of it was personal. Some of it was political and ideo ideological and, of course, they were from different political parties. Um, Jefferson, Marshall seems to have thought that Jefferson at one point was very disloyal to George Washington. And uh, Marshall, like other Washington loyalists, were very offended by that. But for whatever reason, Marshall detested Jefferson. He would refer to him disparagingly as the great llama of the mountains. And Jefferson, for his part, also detested Marshall. He thought everybody was taken in by Marshall. He talked about Marshall's lax and lounging manners. And just one example that shows you how deep was Jefferson's distrust of Marshall. In 1802, Jefferson and Madison got word that Marshall was working on a biography of George Washington. And they were very suspicious of this. And they were convinced that Marshall was going to have a time to come out before the 1804 presidential election. And it was designed to make the Federalists look good and make uh, Jefferson and the Jeffersonians look bad. And so Jefferson and Madison secretly tried to commission a well-known writer, Joel Barlow, to write a rival history of the times. And they promised him they would give him exclusive access to all their papers and lay it out if he would uh, get that uh, rival version out there. So that's the second messy complexity. And the third messy complexity is that the Jefferson administration and Jefferson personally detested the case of uh, Marbury versus Madison and scorned it from the time it was filed all the way up until Jefferson's death. And when Marbury, so much so that when Marbury versus Madison was pending in the Supreme Court, the Jefferson administration refused even to appear and make any arguments. In December 1801, when Charles Lee is fervently arguing in the Supreme Court his case, Jefferson's Attorney General, Levi Lincoln, is in the courtroom. But he doesn't make an appearance. He doesn't say a word in response. And in fact, Marshall, when Lee is done, asks Lincoln, 
if he'd like to speak and address the uh, points that have been raised. And remember, James Madison, the Secretary of State, is the defendant, and it's clearly the President's actions that are at issue. And Lincoln just says, I have no instructions, I have nothing to say. And again, in February 1803, once again, Charles Lee is fervently making his point, and once again, Levi Lincoln and the Jefferson administration refused to make any kind of formal appearance. They refused to make any arguments. In fact, Levi Lincoln has to testify because he had briefly been acting Secretary of State, but, it, but they refused to make any arguments, and this clearly makes Marshall uncomfortable. At one point in February 1803, Charles Lee finishes his fervent argument. Marshall asks Levi Lincoln to speak. Levi Lincoln again says, I have no instructions. I'm not going to speak. Marshall doesn't say anything for a minute. Then he looks around the courtroom. He says, does anybody have anything they want to add? He was uncomfortable getting it only from one side. And so the, but the result is that this greatest of all Supreme Court decisions was rendered entirely on the basis of arguments from only one side of the case. Now, in addition to that, Jefferson bitterly resented the Marbury decision until his dying day. Uh, he, about a year later, he wrote to Abigail Adams that um, he, uh, was very critical of this opinion that gave the Supreme Court the authority to declare uh, statutes unconstitutional and the idea of it, and he hated everything about the opinion. He hated that ruling on constitutionality. He, he thought Marshall was wrong on the merits that, the, that Marbury had a right to his commission. Um, he thought that Marshall should not have gone on to talk about the merits when he was uh, when he had found that there was no jurisdiction. And Jefferson was very, very scathing in his criticism uh, of the Marbury decision. So much so that in 1807, in the treason trial of Aaron Burr, Jefferson actually ordered the U.S. attorney in the Aaron Burr case not to cite Marbury versus Madison to the court. Now, remember, Marbury is a fairly recent Supreme Court precedent at the time. And Jefferson says he wants Marbury recognized as not law as soon as possible. So again, a messy complexity. Now, in my mind, none of these messy complexities detract from the greatness of Marbury versus Madison. I mean, to the contrary, in some ways, I think they actually add to it. Because it makes you realize that Marbury did not just sort of come down from the clouds as received wisdom but it was part of a very messy political situation with the outcome uncertain and many of the most important issues up for grabs. And it maybe even gives you a little bit of hope that in our own messy political uncertainty, things of lasting value can emerge. And finally, I just want to mention for me personally an anecdote that shows um, what I think of as the power and force of Marbury. And um, I also uh, clerked on the uh, Federal Appeals Court in the District of Columbia, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, for Judge J. Skelly Wright. And when I was clerking there, there was a case that we had one time where the Federal Communications Commission um, kept seeming to ignore the opinions of the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit would rule on a point of law, strike down an FCC decision, send it back, and the FCC would basically say, we adhere to our previous view, and come back to the D.C. Circuit. And one of my co-clerks drafted an opinion for Judge Wright, and the first line of it quoted from Marbury that it is emphatically the duty and province of the judicial department to say what the law is. And he left it for Judge Wright. And the next morning, Judge Wright comes into the clerk's office, and he's got the draft in his hand, and he's kind of flipping it against his leg, and he says, you know, you see Marbury versus Madison first thing in the morning, and it really wakes you up. <laughs> And I think that's what Marbury versus Madison does for us as a people. It wakes us up to the rule of law and the importance of it. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if, any, if anybody has questions. Well, it's, it, 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 yes, it's a very, very good point because one thing I want to emphasize 
And you know, one of the things that is disputed is how much it was up for grabs at the time. Did people really think that, oh, the Supreme Court didn't have the power of it and that the power to declare a, a statute unconstitutional? And it it's very much is the case that um, that idea had been out there. And it, as you say, it was in uh, number 78 of the Federalist Papers very explicitly. And in fact, Jefferson himself had expressed that view. Now, my own reading of it is that when you look at the congressional debate and at the statements, including Jefferson's, by that point in the early 1800s, for the Jeffersonians, it had become a disputed point, and it had for a number of reasons. Not for all of them, but for some of them. And it had for a number of reasons. Remember, in the late 1790s, you had the Alien and Sedition Acts that basically criminalized criticism of the government. And you had um, Supreme Court justices on circuit enthusiastically enforcing the Alien and Sedition Acts against these uh, uh, critics. And remember, Jefferson and Madison wrote the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, which declared that Kentucky and Virginia didn't, uh, did not view them as constitutional and uh, raising constitutional objections to them. And so the federal courts on constitutionality had become somewhat discredited. And in addition to that, you have, in the eyes of some Jeffersonians, and in addition to that, you have the situation by the early 1800s that the federal courts were the place where the Federalists were. They also were the agents of the federal government. They were really the most comprehensive part of the national government at that time. And of course, the Jeffersonians were for states' rights rather than the national government. And they were viewed as undemocratic. And the Jeffersonians viewed themselves as very democratic. So um, while there had been Federalist 78 and there had been other examples of state courts de declaring statutes unconstitutional, and the idea was definitely out there, so I don't want to suggest that in any way that it sort of came out of the blue in Marbury. But I, I do think, and there are some people who disagree with this, but I do think by the time Marbury was uh, decided, it had become a disputed point in the political dialogue. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a very good question, um, and it d highlights a point that Marbury was viewed as a big deal at the time, and it was viewed as a big deal by Marshall in the Supreme Court. It was much longer than the typical Supreme Court opinion at the time. It was a long opinion, and most of the time, uh, up until that point, they were, they were issuing pretty short um, opinions. To my knowledge, it was not at all common for them to be printing the Supreme Court uh, opinions. And um, uh, you know, I, th I think that that was uh, a sign of the fact that they interpreted it um, as, as a big deal. It was not the routine practice for the newspapers to be, to be printing it. And they, would, they, they actually printed it in a couple of installments because it was um, sort of so long. You know? And so it sort of showed their view of continuing interest in it as well. Yes? Um, I was wondering uh, for Andrew Jackson, when he ordered the Carol Spears, he kind of kind of overruled the Supreme Court. Didn't they kind of think of Mowbray versus Madison or anything? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question, you know, not now let him enforce it, you know, John Marshall's issues, his opinion, now let him enforce it. And, and you do... Um, you, you, you do see these issues emerge from time to time, both with the federal government and also with states and local governments. I mentioned Cooper versus Aaron. You know, there's this sort of new rage about nullifications with respect to gun laws, that, that, that where a lot of local governments and bills have been introduced in state governments saying that um, if they, that the local sheriff saying if they view the gun laws as unconstitutional, they're not going to enforce them. So these issues do bubble up. In terms of your specific question, I actually, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if people invoked uh, Marbury at the time of the Jackson confrontation. I just don't know that. But the, that is, that's a great question. <laughs>
Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, I know you all joined me in thanking Mr. Sloan for coming, and here's a small gift. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. I have some, some other things. Uh, if somehow you escaped me on the way in and didn't pick up a Humanities Council feedback form, if you could do it on the way out, I'd really appreciate it. We have some cards for the Simon Perry Center if you'd like to be put on a mailing list. If you could take one of the cards off the table, fill it out and drop it off, I'm happy to do that. Finally, I'd like to thank Price Haynes and the West Virginia Bar Association for providing refreshments which are outside the door. I hope you will partake. I think I saw some Sodexo brownies, so if you're smart, you, you will partake. Um, Thank you for coming. Our next lecture is Thursday, April 18th, and I hope you'll be back. Thanks.